After the album's release, Dylan went back on the road. Since June 1988, he had been playing an alarming number of shows, touring almost non-stop with an evolving backing band. Later termed the never-ending tour, it would continue into 1990 with large South American gigs and further tours in Canada and Europe. In the spring, he managed to find time to return to the studio with more new material, and an all-star cast of players, including Elton John, George Harrison, Slash and David Crosby, were recruited to add their talent, under the watchful eye of hit producers Don and David Woz. Despite the firepower of the assembled musicians on the album, on its release, Under the Red Sky was roundly dismissed as a lightweight follow-up to Oh Mercy. Commercially, it was a disappointment, and later Dylan himself would claim that the album had been rushed and that too many celebrity cameos had resulted in a confused record. Yet it was the album's lyrical content that came under as much criticism as its sound. I remember at the time the reviews were quite critical because they, they said that basically it's like just like nursery rhymes, uh, these songs. And we know now that Dylan, thanks to the, the pioneering work of a biographer, Howard Soons, he unearthed Dylan's second marriage, which nobody knew about at the time. And um, from that union, they, I think he just had a, a, a child from his, his second wife who, who uh, from memory, was born around the time that Under the Red Sky was being made and released. So, so in fact, you know, Under the Red Sky is, is, is Bob Dylan as daddy doing a, an album for his kid, you know. And knowing that, that's, that's fine, you know, he can do whatever he wants. But at the time, and particularly coming immediately after uh, Oh Mercy, it was seen as another one of those, you know, he's taking you up the mountaintop and then under his sky plunges you straight down into the valley because, it, it, again, it really doesn't wear uh, terribly well at all. It's a, it's a, it's a very a very flimsy record. I think that the problem with Under the Red Sky for many commentators was that they just took one listen to the lyrics and decided it was terribly banal and um, unworthy of Dylan. It suffered critically by had, by coming after Oh Mercy, which was the great epic Dylan return to form for many people. Um, but Under the Red Sky, certainly, I, I, I enjoyed it immensely. I thought it was quite a strong record and much underappreciated um, amongst, except for a, a number of Dylan aficionados like myself, who you know, still claim it's a decent record. <laughs> I think the reason Under the Red Sky wasn't taken seriously was that it was silly. That's the very reason I like it. The Dylan myth does not uh, conform to silliness that doesn't tolerate uh, the prophet being silly. Um, to me, the record has a lightness about it, uh, and the songwriting, I don't, I don't think there's a song I don't like on that record. Nobody else likes that record. I don't know, except outside of my immediate family, all of whom agree with me. I don't know anybody who likes that record. I think with Wiggle Wiggle, I mean, it reminded me a bit of Shake, Shake, Rattle and Roll or something. I think it was Dylan going back very much to sort of early rock and roll. We know he was a great fan of Little Richard and he liked rock and roll. And I, th I think he was, you know, just looking for a, a, a new way of expressing himself um, without having anything particularly to, to express. And those songs didn't either, like Shake, Rattle and Roll. I mean, it, they were just, you know, and Dylan loved all the old R&B and blues stuff. And some of those lyrics were quite simple. The other aspect of, of the lyrics, of course, was the nursery rhyme quality they had, um, which was self-evident. Um, two by two was, was basically just my old man again. It was, you know, knick-knack, paddywhack, give a dog a bone, this old man comes, came rolling home, and it's, that's the song. But the title track itself, Under the Red Sky, was, was intriguing too, because I think Dylan took that nursery rhyme quality, and I'd have liked him to have done more of this. But, um, you know, the, the, it, it, it did have a, a slightly darker and more macabre side to it. Um, somebody pulled him up for saying, you know, the little boy and the little girl, and they were baked in a pie, and people were saying that's a terrible line. But I thought, well, no, it's actually, it's, it's, it's quite evocative, and it, and it takes me straight back to Hansel and Gretel. And I like that. And I also think that those songs, you know, a lot of people say, oh, that was Dylan doing that, and, and he, he got out of that nursery rhyme thing. But actually, he didn't. I mean, if you, if you go forward, if you go to even Froggy Was a Courting, which people cite as a folk ballad, but it's also a, a children's nursery rhyme in many respects. 
And um, Tweedledum and Tweedledee as late as Love and Theft. I mean, that continues the tradition. You know, you've got brains being boiled in a pot, which is very similar to the, the two children being baked in a pie. I mean, these aren't just throwaway lines. It actually does have a very strong visual image attached to it, and it does go right back to that old scaring the kids in Hansel and Gretel. Let me Let the wind blow high One day the little boy and the little girl Were both baked in a pie I think there are also problems with people's sense of the production. It, it didn't have the, the epic scope of a Daniel Lanois. Don was coming in as a very commercial producer, it seemed, and that was enough to put people off. And also the fact that it uh, had this grand array of superstars uh, that, that he brought in. I mean, you know, you had Slash on there, or Slash on a, on a Bob Dylan record, for goodness sake. You had, you know, David Crosby, Bruce Hornsby, etc., etc. But I, I thought the modern production worked, and the reason I felt overall it did work was, was that um, they had the sense also to bring in David Lindley, who played slide guitar, apart from one track, I think George Harrison played slide guitar in it, but Lindley was ever-present throughout that album. And he brought a great um, sort of blues authenticity to it, I felt. I think there was a, there was a lot of good you know, gut bucket blues in there, which, when you aligned it with the modern production, had an interesting effect. I mean, it was an interesting juxtaposition, I thought, of the, of the, of the production and, and that uh, blues styling. And I thought it worked pretty well. I don't know why Red Sky was the failure it was, uh, except something as facile as the gestalt was against him. You know, just, you know, the time was wrong. You know, just as... Uh, putting out Desire after Blood on the Tracks, you know. If he'd have put out another Blood on the Tracks, there's no way it would have been received as well because it just didn't have the shock value. Well, Oh Mercy had the shock value. And the Red Sky, if it had been as good as Oh Mercy, which I think it is, that's somehow disappointing. That doesn't give them a story. And I think Dylan kind of started to question, why do I do this? What is the point? 